David fled from the presence of Saul after Jonathan confirmed to him that Saul was trying to kill him. When he fled, he fled to, uh, to the tabernacle, to Abimelech, the high priest, in a town called Nob. And he, David is a good example for us because we might ask ourselves, where do we go when we face trouble? First thing we do in sickness, is it to go to the doctor? First thing we do when we are wronged, is it to seek legal help? First thing to do when we're in danger is to seek uh, help from the police. Now, I don't mean to speak against these things. They're provided for us, and we should take advantage of that which is provided for us. The Lord did not go through the walls on the first day of the week, or he would not have gone through the walls if the doors were open. So we take advantage of that which is provided for us. But where do we put our true faith and trust? Now the exact location of Nob is not known, but we know it was a high place high priestly city because Abimelech was there and the tabernacle was there and the confusing thing is that at that time we know the tabernacle was at Gibeon and so this passage tells us it's at Nob and other passages show that it's at Gibeon so how do we reconcile that? Well, if you look in uh, the book of Joshua and chapter 21, you see that the high priestly cities were apportioned and uh, it speaks of Gibeon and its suburbs. So I have no doubt that Nob was one of the suburbs of Gibeon and thus it is called part of Gibeon. Now, if you look at Gibeon on the map, you'll see it's about five miles away from Gibeah, and it's important not to confuse those things. Gibeah was Saul's town, where he was, where his home was, and where he reigned, and the ruins of his fortress are still to be seen in Gibeah. Now it's interesting that Gibeah is the town that so abused the Levites' concubine that you read about in the book of Judges. Saul's forefathers were men of the flesh for sure, and it seems that Saul has taken after some of his forefathers, alas. And so the two towns were fairly nearby but there was a world of difference between them. And so we might say there's an invisible line between those two towns. And I ask each one of us, on which side of that invisible line do we want to be? On the side of the world in the flesh? Or on the side of that which represented the presence of the God of Israel? When David came to Abimelech, Abimelech refers to the young men that are with him. And perhaps there were four of them because David asked for five loaves, and that would be one loaf for each one of the five. We don't know for sure. But these were young men that were not very important. If they were important, they would have been in Saul's court. So I should say not very important in the eyes of the world. But they chose to follow David in his exile. They were probably with him when Jonathan shot his arrows. They probably had been uh, following David because he was known to be the anointed one. And they were 
young, probably less than 20 years old. And I'd like to consider that passage in 1 Timothy where it says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. In word, the way you talk, is that an example of believers? In conversation, conversation means a matter of life. In the matter of life, are you an example of believers? In charity, these are things that we all can do. In spirit, what kind of spirit do you have? Is it a happy spirit or is it a gloomy spirit? The happy spirit testifies that that which you have makes a difference in your life. We don't want to go around with a gloomy spirit in faith. Is it clear to others around where our faith rests? In purity, a pure life. These are not things that require us to be a a giant amongst Christians. These are things that you and I, if we commit ourselves unto the Lord, can do. Then it says, till I come, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. These are things that a young man can do. A young woman can do these things. Now, throughout history, young men have changed the world. Think of Joseph. He was 30 years old when he was made second in command of the entire, well, technically third in command of the entire kingdom. Think of David. As a young man, he must have been about 20 about the time of this encounter with Abimelech. By the time he was 30, he was king over Israel. Think of Daniel and his three friends. They're probably somewhere around 20 themselves, at most. Think of Martin Luther. 33 years old was he when he hammered his 95 thesis onto the door of Wittenberg Chapel. <clears throat> Think of the Great Awakening. They're started by a bunch of college kids, the Wesley brothers and George Whitfield in America, Jonathan Edwards. Think of Charles <clears throat> Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was less than six. He was uh, less than sixteen years old when he preached his first sermon, and by the time he was in his early twenties, he was preaching to thousands. He's known as the Prince of Preachers. Think of a few young men in the 1820s who began to gather on the dual principles of the unity of the body of Christ and the priesthood of all believers. <clears throat> and of course, the most significant of all, incontestably the most significant figure of all history, the one who finished his career and his work at age 33, and his disciples were all young men also. I'm not saying that you young men and women need to display your insubordination. My generation, I'm sad to say, has shown the results of that. But I am saying that if you commit your life to him, there can be great blessing in your life. And it may very well prove that you will be a great blessing to others.